Okay, we've talked about transformers in general. Let's talk more specifically about GPT, Generative Pre-Trained Transformers. These have been made famous by OpenAI and GPT-4 and ChatGPT and whatever is going to come after all that, right? So let's talk about how GPT works. Now, I'm specifically looking at the architecture here of GPT-2 because despite the name OpenAI, they're actually not open at all about their current models and how they work. They tell you a few things, but not the details. And although people like to think it's because they're trying to protect humanity from uh, gaining access to this uh, technology that might uh, destroy all humans, no, it's really just more about uh, not having their competitors replicate what they're doing because it's totally replicable. Uh, there's nothing magic going on here. Like, <laughs> it just, it's not that hard once you look at it. So here's like the entire architecture of GPT-2 to the right. Let's, let's walk through it in a little bit. So the key thing here, we're not seeing an encoder and a decoder stack here, right? We're just seeing a decoder stack. And that's what differentiates GPT. Now, since everything's being parallelized now, we don't need to process things in sequence and work through our way through a bunch of RNNs to have some hidden state for text and pass that on to a decoder. There's really not a whole lot of value into having separate encoders and decoders anymore in the world of transformers. So in the case of GPT, we just have the decoder stack and that's it. And we just make that as big and fat and complicated as we can to embed as much information as we can into it. So, as an aside, uh, there are other transformer models out there, right? GPT is not the only one. One that came before it from Google is called BERT, and that consists only of encoders, as opposed to GPT, which consists only of decoders. And there are still models out there that have both encoders and decoders. Uh, T5 is one example of that. So let's take a look at what's going on here. So we have all this input processing going on. We talked about that briefly. We have to uh, translate all of our words into tokens. Those in turn get translated into embeddings, you know, vectors that represent their meaning, if you will. We then do something called positional encoding that we'll talk about shortly. Uh, not gonna go there yet. But then we have these stacks of decoder blocks. And every one of those decoder blocks consists of a masked self-attention layer, which we just talked about, below a giant feed-forward neural network that it goes into. So the key here is that we're stacking those one on top of each other. There could be hundreds of these things, right? And each one of these could be massive and have a massive neural network within them. And at each stage, we're going to go back and do self-attention again and do another giant neural network again and then pass it on to another self-attention block, which goes into another giant neural network. And this is where all the real complexity of these models arises, right? So GPT-4 is rumored to have over 1 trillion parameters. Most of them probably live in that mess right there, right? So the training of that is the challenge. You know, it costs millions of dollars to feed enough information into a neural network of this size to actually get meaningful results out of it. But that's what they did. You know, that's that's the magic there. Now, I want to also reiterate that there is no concept of input per se. All it's doing is taking this giant list of tokens and processing them all in parallel. OK, so the input is all being passed in at once. Please translate me and some token. That means I want you to translate this to Klingon is what goes into this thing. And there's a bunch of other empty token spots here for the output but we're not really processing this sequentially. We're taking this whole thing and pushing it through out the other end. We're going to get, please translate me magic token. And then the next word, which in this case will be I, right? So I guess that's Klingon for please, if there is such a thing. <laughs> and then we do it again, right? So then we say, please translate me translation token. I push it all through and we get back the next word in our translation, whatever it is. But it doesn't really know the difference between the input and the output. It just has a sequence of tokens that are being processed in parallel. So that's a key point that I want to get through here. We're not really doing this, although we're generating one word at a time by running this through every time we want to generate a new token in the sequence, um, each time through, there's no concept of input and output. There's just this string of tokens and it learns through this giant block of decoders stacked on, on top of each other, how to deal with that. Okay. Now it doesn't really need to know what's the input, what's the output, what words are, words are coming in what order because of the concept of self attention. So that attention, is used to, used to maintain the relationships between previous words and tokens as they're being processed. That's the trick there to let us do this all in parallel. So you will prompt this big machine with tokens that represent your question or what you want to translate or whatever it might be. And it will just keep on generating a new token based on the previous tokens it saw before it. And those previous tokens could be partially your input and partially it's incomplete output, right? But it doesn't care. It doesn't care. And getting rid of the idea of inputs and outputs is a powerful concept in itself because that allows us to train this system just on piles of unlabeled text. 
So if I give it a Wikipedia article, its job is to try to generate that Wikipedia article back one token at a time, given the beginning of it, right? So it becomes its own training data, its own evaluation data, if you will. And that allows it to learn a language, if you will, rather than optimizing for some specific task. So I don't have like some classification at the top here that's either right or wrong, or I have some human labeling that and saying, yeah, that was right, go reinforce those weights. No, I'm just giving it raw text, right? And its ability to get reasonably close to the text that I fed it, given just a piece of that text, is how it's being trained. So that's powerful because it means I can take all the text on the internet, throw it into this thing for training, and not have to deal with labeling it at all. And that, again, is a key to the scale of how these things are trained with so much information. And what we end up with, again, is basically a model that has learned the language, how to speak English, how to speak Klingon, whatever it might be. That's what we're ending up with here at the end of the day. And like I said, GPT-2 on its own is hundreds of billions of parameters. When we work up to modern models like GPT-4, it's rumored to be well over 1 trillion parameters. So that's the scale that we're talking about here. And your brain has a lot of parameters too. So this is an important diagram. Let's walk through it one more time. So we start off with our tokens. Please translate me in a token that means translate it. This could just be another token that says, please complete this sentence. It could be some other application entirely, right? Doesn't have to be translation. Each token goes into an embedding matrix, right? So we end up with this embedding vector that represents where this token lives in the space of things that have similar meanings. We then do positional encoding, and this adds some information into that embedding that gives us some information about where that token stands in relationship to the other tokens around it. And then we go into this, these stacks of decoder blocks, where each decoder block consists of mask self-detention, going into a feed-forward neural network, and that in turn goes to the self-attention block of the next decoder block over and over and over again. There could be like a hundred of these things. When we're done, we end up with a final embedding that comes out of the feed-forward neural network of the final decoder block, and then that can be converted to probabilities for what the next token should be. So out of all the tokens that we have, we can see what is the most likely token to follow the one that I just was given. And in this case, it might be I, okay? That's how it works.